you're trying to peel back layers of resistance so that you don't resist what's in front of you. And when you have no resistance for what's in front of you, that centers you in your true power and it allows you to respond to that situation optimally. So what you're gonna have is somebody who's say new to personal transformation or waking up so to speak, they're going to hear about getting present to the moment. From a book, a good entry point would be say The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. There's many different entry points. Back in the day it would have been Krishnamurti or others. Now what you have is they realize, okay, get present to the moment. So the typical person's been trapped in their mind in very dense thinking for many, many years. And the first time that they ever get present to the moment, it is like a breath of fresh air. They're, they're probably hooked for life, right? All the seminars that you see when people want to like bow at the feet of the guru is because they got present to the moment for the first time ever. Years of weight and baggage finally went off them. They could actually think clearly they had access to power for the first time. Um, they see how much other people don't get any of that and then they want more. So what happens is that they get present to the moment. What does that mean? We don't think about the past. We're not paranoid about the future. Most people live in kind of a victim of the past and it loops or they're projecting into some future that may or may not happen and kind of always trying to plot it out and it, and it puts them in their head, but they're never present, which means they're not in their power. They're away from their power. They're not trusting their own ability to merge into the moment and handle it as it comes. So what happens is thinking is great, but if you have thinking and then you, you know your logical mind and then you have your simple awareness or being present to the moment, most people are, are, are mind dominated. They are using thinking too much. And there is, I mean, we could make hours of videos and seminar about what this does to people. We could go out into the street and show you how it affects them in the pupil, how it affects the, the way that they're projecting their energy, how it affects their opinions. It, it's, it's just too dense. It's, it's very similar to a cancer. It's just sort of eating itself. It's very cancerous. It's like a, like a stagnant swamp rather than a flowing river. So what you wanna do instead is you wanna use thinking um, in service of present awareness rather than maybe thinking all the time and just getting present when you take drugs, drink alcohol, dance, or go skiing, <laughs> which is the majority of people. So what'll happen is when you get present for a moment, it feels really good. And then later when you can't get present, you start stumbling all over yourself because you're like, oh, if I could just get present, I could do this. You know, I could go approach that person if I was present. I could deliver a better public speaking event if I was present. You can imagine, take myself, right? I have a lot of um, experiment, like social experiments that I've done in my life. Now I'd have these moments where I'd get present to the moment and I'd go out and talk to people and I would talk to 100 or 200 people and the responses that I would get would be through the roof. Girls screaming, I love you, you're amazing. Guys like, you're hilarious. Like, you know, this is my night. I'm like a young nerdy guy. And I don't know how much has changed, but you know, I'm a young nerdy guy. And I'm seeing this and I'm like, well, when I get present to the moment, that happens. And when I'm trapped in my head, I get kind of weird. I, I struggle to talk to people and it's not good. So, well, what's gonna happen? I'm getting addicted to getting present. Likewise, if I do public speaking, maybe I have a day where I'm very trapped in my head. I struggle to communicate. I stumble over my words. There's a lack of power or flow to the audience. Well, if I have an experience where I just ripped a public speaking event, I just crushed it, you know, I talk into five, 600 people, the audience is, has big bright eyes and everybody's laughing at every joke that I make and captivated by every story that I tell and they're hooked on it. Well, what happens that day when I get in front of a crowd and I'm trapped in my head? Well, I can't, just, I can't get into a flow, I can't get present. Right now you're addicted to it, which is exactly the opposite of what presence work teaches, what spiritual growth teaches, what the Zen arts would teach. That's what you don't want. So the lowest level is a guy who's trapped in his head, has never been present, and he just has that discovery. But the next level is that when you can't get present, you have to drop your resistance to that. You have to say, it's cool that I'm trapped in my head. I love being trapped in my head. Being trapped in my head is awesome. I like the fact that I'm completely negative right now <laughs> and super victim, this is great. And then what happens is when you drop that layer of resistance to it, then it's like you peel back the onion another layer. And what happens is as soon as you strip the layer of resistance around it, then you get present. But then what happens, and this is kind of funny and just not to make you go crazier, then you get even more present and then you get addicted to that. So, you know, so now you have to, and, and then you hit a ceiling with that. So now you've got to pull off a layer of resistance to that. And you're gonna go through, I mean, this is such a deep topic because you're even gonna go through different layers of of like your circle of concern. So, and, and, it's, and it all keeps coming back in these bizarre loops. So for example, like when you're younger, maybe you're just focused on yourself. You're very selfish. That makes your energy very, very dense. Then you learn, you know what? If I focus on others, then my energy becomes lighter and more expansive. 
you'll feel it. Like just simply if I say right now, get yours, get yours, versus if I say, I'm there for you. Let's be there for others. Let's make the world a better place. You can feel the energy shifting, but more importantly, you can feel how much access to your faculties you have. You suddenly feel more calm, happier, more energy, more resourceful, aligned. It's incredible how you'll feel just making simple shifts like that. And then aligning your thoughts and behavior to that energy, to that more powerful energy. So then you start thinking things like, I'm gonna leave a legacy. I wanna leave a great legacy with my life, a legacy of love, a legacy of contribution, and that will drive you fuel you and feed you. Later though, what you even realize is that you have to let go even of attachment to that. Because what starts to happen is that you realize that even with whatever legacy you leave or whatever amount you help people, that even that's not permanent. And then it, it, then it, then it even comes down to, it's not even just about, it's not even just like merging the being into the doing. You just realize that ultimately it's like, it's the person who you became in that process and that the world is as it is. You cannot, as a single person, change, you know, just you change the whole world and make everybody wake up. It's hard enough to wake yourself up. I love how people are like, we're gonna wake up the world. The world is joining into a higher consciousness. Like, dude, I saw you mad when you couldn't get the Kit Kat bar out of the vending machine. Let's, let's come on, like, let's get real, okay? Let's, you know, let's keep taking baby steps here and celebrate some small wins. People come up to me all the time, say, you're gonna make a billion dollars, you're gonna change the world. I'm like, look, you know, if me and Jill get on our YouTube video this week, can we stay in a good mood? That's good progress for us, and if we keep doing that, will build from there. So you know, a lot of time I think people use these monstrous goals as a way to avoid doing the basic smaller goals that they really could accomplish. It's almost like a way of numbing yourself from you know, what you really could do right now. You make something so big that you just can't do it. So instead, like people will say to us, like, what's your five-year plan? We're like, look, we're, we're gonna get a TM done this week. It's gonna be really amazing. The audience is gonna love it. We're gonna get some good testimonials. We're, you know, we're gonna do, shoot some YouTube videos and then we're gonna maybe plan our next product launch. But then what happens is that you can merge fully into that. You can merge fully into that. And then as you do that, then you can make your next plan and you can also have long-term plans too. But that's sort of how we take it. So that's the whole idea of layers of resistance and you go through a journey with it. And you know, in the end, ideally, you'd come to a place where you really don't resist anything. Um, and and it's, it's, like, it's a Zen paradox, essentially. It's like, you, know, you want the butterfly, if you grab it too much, you kill it. If you, you know, if you, you, know, you have to just like be okay with whatever would happen and then it stays. A great first approach which is what most traditional meditational practices preach is focus on the now. No, all your problems, just focus on the right now. And it's a good first step. You focus on the present moment, you focus on a spot on the wall, you focus on a mantra, you repeat your mantra. And by doing so for a long period of time, what happens if you're just focused on this, everything else fades away. All your problems fade away in this side, but it's like gone and you're just now, 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 now. Now it's great, what happens when you stop doing it? Back into the muck of it all and nothing really changed. So a lot of us use it as an escape. We try to directly pursue presence. I've done that. Yeah. I mean, which is great. It does help you focus on something for a long period of time. It definitely helps say a lot of public speaking. It's a great first step. But what about shifting it to what's all this muck that's pulling me away from just being present by default? Instead of trying to escape the past and everything by focusing on presence, focus on the stuff you're trying to escape, let go of it, and now you're just there. You're no longer pulled in all these different directions. What is enlightenment? What is presence? We have all these criterions, and then when we don't meet them, we beat ourselves up. So it's like present means I'm fully right here right now. So say you're stuck in your head, like you said. What if you're stuck in your head? Well, you could change what is presence. Like, can you be present being stuck in your head? Letting go of the resistance to being stuck in your head. You could interpret presence as just full self-acceptance, non-attachment, non-resistance. It goes back to Buddhism. And again, it's like, what's bad about being stuck in your head? The label you placed on it. The fact that you're saying this is bad. Imagine, you know, you've been watching my videos for a while and say all my videos like, dude, being stuck in your head is awesome. It is so good. You don't want to be out of your head. You want to be stuck in your head. That's the best thing ever. And you're watching that nonstop. And then you see other teachers and they're all saying the same things. All your friends are like, oh man, I'm so out of my head. I hate this. I wish I was stuck in my head. <laughs> what would happen as soon as you're stuck in your head? You're like, yes. And there wouldn't be, you'd be present to that. So it's more so like being aware of all those different labels. The same with emotions, by the way. You know, we feel bad about feeling bad. If you, felt, if you enjoyed feeling bad, it'd be fine. You'd feel awesome. That's the key. It's like learn to feel good feeling bad. Enjoy anger. Enjoy all that. Now here's the other subtlety is we think that say if we embrace something like anger, uh, we're going to propel more of it. Or frustration, we're going to propel more of it. But in reality, 
by you embracing it and feeling it, you will feel more whole by default. And all those quote unquote, what we label negative emotions or states will start fading away. You'll just experience it less by default, but you can only attack it indirectly. You can't get rid of the anger by embracing the anger. It'll just stop coming up as much. What about expressing it? So I get that you want to accept uh -huh. it and let yourself feel it, but what about? Expressing it can be good, but it doesn't get to the cause. So say you express it, usually we express it like when we pop, we just oh, we go off the handle and express it. And it usually just takes a little bit of that pressure off what we're keeping down there, but that's what we do. We express it to just take a little off so we can keep the rest stuffed down. But then when you express it, what happens? You propel it in the world. So, I mean, it's fine to express it, but the key is release it, process it, feel it. Is that the same Feeling thing is the key. As opposed to dumping it on somebody and just infecting them with it. Here's the, what we'll call good. Here's the bad. What's in the good? Happiness, enthusiasm, excitement, passion, right? Laughter. What's in the bad? Stress, fear, anger, so on and so forth. We, we label Insult, everything. Jealousy. Now, here's the, the thing. Okay, you're going to experience these either way. These are good as we discussed before. You have a certain emotion for a reason. Now, because we resist them, they become states, but we have emotions for a reason. And most people just get swung back and forth because they're going to come either way. You're swung back and forth, attached to the good, resisting the bad. And because of that, you're in this constant perpetual state of suffering. Now, the solution- And, and, and really um, audit that. I would urge you guys to audit the degree to which you suffer from this duality. Really, really audit. How often am I really happy? Yeah. And then the solution, unfortunately, a lot of people take is, you know what? I'm sick of this swing. So what am I going to do? Not feel. Fuck the good emotions. Sure, I won't be happy and enthusiastic, but hey, if I don't feel the good ones, I don't feel the bad ones. And you go into apathy. Now that's is not what you want. And if you're here in a state of apathy, if that was what you want, you wouldn't be here. But the key here is let go of the resistance to the bad and the attachment to the good and embrace it all. And funny enough, when you embrace it all, that's when you feel for the first time. Because even now, when you feel these good emotions, you're not actually allowing yourself to bask in them fully because there's a certain attachment to them. You know the pendulum swing's coming. You're gonna get pulled right back into the bad ones. So if you allow yourself to experience the good ones fully, the suffering's gonna to be too great. So you kind of experience them, and in the background, there's always that fear of like, when is it coming? When is it coming? Oh my God, I gotta keep this. When is the bad stuff coming? And it's still torture. When you just embrace everything, now you're free and suffering is gone. So it's catching all those labels, catching that Acceptance. conditioning. Acceptance. Yep. Again, big mantra, no attachments. <gasps> No aversions, I also, no attachments, no aversion. Yeah, what I love to do is if I feel negative about something, I notice that my reticular activation system is focusing on it, and I say to myself, it's focusing me on this negative thing to urge me to find a solution to it quickly and shake it off. So that mechanism is there evolutionarily in order to get you to focus on something that could be problematic. So one of the things that often Joe and I have struggled with with traditional schools of enlightenment is this idea that you're okay, you know, you never break presence. You never feel a negative emotion. The way that I personally view it, and again, I'm not, you know, I'm not the 85 year old dude at the mountaintop in India, so I'm just saying how I view it as, as a you know, younger dude sitting here in, in a more modern lifestyle. For me, the way that I view it is that you have this presence underneath it, right? So for example, like if, my, if I got a phone call right now that my son was killed, it would not be my asper, and that, that can happen. You guys need to understand that. I had a friend die last week. So you can't, I, I'm not gonna expect myself to have no reaction at all, just to be in a blissful state. May, perhaps that could be something to be achieved at some point. But I don't feel that I'm at a point where my purpose here on this earth is to be like that right now. I don't feel that that's my purpose right now. If, if I was at that point, maybe I was about to transcend to some other dimension or something, fair enough. But I don't, like, I feel right now there's work to be done here. So what I would feel is I'd feel a deep sadness, like my, when my friend passed away, I felt very sad for him. More, more importantly, I felt sad for his loved ones, the people he left behind. But, because essentially he's gone, right? I feel, I feel sad for the people still here particularly. But at the same time, there's still an element of presence there. I'm at peace with it. I understand that we all have our time. I understand that every moment is a gift. 
I understand that life is not necessarily measured by the length of it, but also the quality of it. And he had actually a pretty incredible life. I, there's, a, there's an element of presence beneath the sadness, right? So it's like there's a deep ocean, and then there's the ripple on the top. For most people, it's like the whole thing is this big freaking wave. When you've cultivated presence, there's that ocean of presence, and then there's the movement on the top is a way of thinking it. That's how I personally interpret it. There's many different people you could learn from, but that's how I take it. So if you think enlightenment, the way we kind of approach it, same as presence, is I'm always happy, positive all the time. But once more, then there's the resistance. You're falling into the same trap of then, once you're enlightened and all positive, it's like, I don't want to be negative, don't want to be negative. Okay, so remember, all emotions you have for a reason. It sends you valuable data. If you experience guilt, that's valuable data. You did something that was out of integrity with who you are, what you valued. Lesson learned. Fear. A lion comes. I'm not afraid. You're dead. If you didn't experience fear, you'd be dead. But once more, the difference is between the emotion and the state. You resist it, now it's a state. In terms of presence or enlightenment, or what happens when you embrace it all, think of a video game. That's the best way to put it. If you take a game like, say, GTA minus the killing and everything, there's the character, and then there's you. Here's the game, the world, the universe of the game. Here's the little controller. Here's you sitting here playing the controller. And here's a little character in the game, okay, running around doing shit. This character's perspective in the game, this character is going to experience fear, anger. This character's value and self-worth increases as you level up, right? That character's experience of the game is very different than the player's experience of the game. For the character, it's like everything's very real. It's like, oh shit, shit, oh my god, like that. For you, you're experiencing the same thing. But there's not a certain resistance. The experience your relationship to what's going on inside is different. And that's the key. It's like we're conditioned to live everything first person. So everything's very heavy, we get triggered, it's all real. Zone out, you still experience it, but your relationship with it is very different. And you're less attached and resistant. Like being a player, you love the anxiety moments. That's what makes the game interesting. But because you embrace it, now it's fun, as opposed to <gasps> attached. The same is here. This guy can level up, this girl can level up. But your self-worth doesn't change. And that's what we do. We attach our self-worth to what's going on inside as opposed to know I'm already enough. And from this perspective, thrive in life. Another thing I would add too is that there's a lot of practical reasons why this is very results oriented. What we're teaching you here, we don't want to be abstract. We want to show you how this gets results. Again, we could spend many hours breaking down how too much identification with thought, it makes the energy too dense. And it, ironically, it's a very strange thing, but people who are very locked into their thinking, they're the ones who need the message the most, and yet they're the ones who will resist that change the most, versus people that are actually pretty loose and pretty present. They get it so easily, but they don't even need to hear it. So it's kind of an irony. So we're kind of trying to hit those people somewhere in that middle ground who we might be able to kind of draw your awareness to it if that's the case. Now, a couple key points here. One is that I would categorize two different things. Say you have what you'd call low vibration energy or trauma energy. There's two levels to it. A, how much actual trauma energy are you carrying? But B, how identified are you with that trauma energy? So I still carry trauma energy. But one thing that I've learned from years of teaching and studying it is that if a pain body attack comes up for me, I'm aware of the specific characteristics of that type of thinking. So have any of you guys ever had that feeling to send like the, like the company-wide email where you just rip everybody apart and then the next day you wake up and you've humiliated yourself and maybe you even got fired? You ever had that feeling? <laughs> That's a pretty common thing, right? You ever piped off on your partner in a way that you're humiliated about later? Well, you can feel that pain body attack. Eckhart Tolle called that a pain body attack. Call it trauma energy, low vibration energy, negativity, whatever you want to call it, that's fine. Well, if you can feel it controlling your thinking, you can begin to identify the characteristics. It's typically very competitive, you versus them. It's looping on negative thoughts, looping on negative outcomes. It's lacking gratitude. It's focus on the bad with no consideration for the good. It's often, here's the key to it, it's often not wrong. You don't get fooled with complete BS. You actually get fooled with things that are true. If you're mad at your partner, you're probably thinking things of them that are true. It's just that it has, that negative energy has obscured all of the good parts. And you'll see this because maybe you've had your partner mad at you and they'll rip you to shreds, but you're like, it's not that that's necessarily wrong, but there's all this other good stuff that, that we did together and good experiences that we had and you don't seem to be able to see it. Maybe you've seen that during a breakup where your partner 
you know, thinks that you're the devil for a couple months, right? Because there's so much negative energy around it. You start to think, well, is that bad? Later, after they've probably got some new boyfriend or girlfriend and, you know, now they're mad at them, <laughs> you know, they remember your relationship as like, it was so great. My new one's a jerk, right? Because the negative energy is controlling them. Well, that, that same negative energy that was on you now goes on their new partner and then they can actually see you in a more balanced manner. When you detect yourself in that really negative mode, yeah, maybe you have some trauma energy there. You're being what's called activated. Say that word, activated. activated. Okay, so you're being activated. But if you know the characteristics of it, it's like, say that, say that like, when I was a kid, I drank a few times in high school. Not a ton, but I tried out because I thought it would be cool. And I can remember, one of the biggest differences with me and my friends was they would get plastered and they would start like jumping off of like cliffs into the water, which is super dangerous if you're really drunk. Or they'd go like, you know, steal a car, like do something crazy. And I'm like, what I would always do is like, I'd be like, yeah, jump off the cliff, like do this bad thing. And I'd be like, I just simply do this. Simple question you can ask yourself. Would I do this when I'm sober? <laughs> like that's, so even, even wasted, by the way, I could be wasted. I'd be like, would I do this when I'm sober? And I'd be like, I think I would. And I'd be like, but I don't remember any instances of doing that when I was sober. <laughs> that probably means I wouldn't. So what you want to do is familiarize yourself with when you're being activated, trauma energy. You want to say to yourself, when I was in a great mood, how did I think? When I was in a great mood, what did I focus on? And if you can familiarize yourself with that, it's almost like you're kind of drunk and in this kind of haze, but you can sort of, it, and it feels so real when you're being activated, right? It feels like when people commit suicide, for example, their problems seem so real. It's so real to them that it drives them to self-annihilation and there's suicides every year. So what I found helpful in my own life was simply remembering what was it like when I had that frame of reference when I was in a positive mood. And then I say to myself, Will this pass? It's like a wave, it'll pass. Then I say to myself, you know, could I think differently than this? A lot of people will take psychedelic drugs for that reason. They feel that it gives them a frame of reference for a different way of thinking. I don't do those, but I respect why people have their reasons for doing that because essentially it shows them that they could think in a different way. So you wanna be very aware of how you think in a positive mode and how you think in a negative mode. And then when you are having those attacks, simply recall through the haze, say the word through the haze, the Recall the positivity. <laughs> okay? Or at least maybe a balanced outlook. Say that word, a balanced, balanced outlook. outlook. Okay, say balanced, balanced outlook. outlook. It doesn't even have to be super positive, but it's got to be balanced, right? Well, that girl, like, you know, or guy ripped you apart during a breakup, it's not that they were maybe wrong about the critique of you, but they're not focusing on the positive as well. It's not a balanced thing. It's highly, it's very charged with reactivity. So you want to be aware of when your behavior is getting charged with reactivity and it's kind of pulling you down this rabbit hole. In my own case, probably the only place that I'll get like that anymore is sometimes there'll be people who I work with or associate with where I know that they feed off that kind of energy. And I know that like if I call them in a good mood or laughing, they're li it actually infuriates them. And it's to the point that they can't even hear what I'm saying. So I'll kind of try to put it on and be like, look, I know, it's terrible, just terrible, but da 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 da. And again, it's not that they're wrong. They're, usually they're right about the thing they're frustrated about. Actually, I agree with them. But if I don't sort of you know, connect with them where they're at. And that's another thing too, is that for Juliet and myself, we mostly like to be very lighthearted and laugh. But oftentimes in our seminars, we will try to get more serious. In fact, at the event the other night, we tried to get a little bit more heavy because we understand that there are people where if we're laughing, having fun, it just looks like a couple fairies at the front, like, wee, wee. They, they can't get it, right? So, so, so sometimes you've got to meet people where they're at, okay? You've got to see where they're at and meet them there. Often in marketing, you have to do that, right? If, if, if most of the world's in a very low vibration state, if you market at a high vibration, they may not be able to... Uh, see that. The, the, the irony is people who are more serious or mind dominated, if they see us being positive, they're like, they're just being positive because it's just like the marketing, the real world is harsh and, t and bad. And I'm like, actually, in a pyramid, most of the people at the bottom, the, the biggest part of the pyramid is the bottom, and that's almost all highly negative. And so if you want to market, go negative is actually a great move. Um, that's why McDonald's will usually sell more than like, you know, salad heaven or something, you know, whatever it would be. Here it would be Pluto's, <laughs> right? There's probably more McDonald's than Pluto's. So Pluto's has a great salad, I just had one. So you're in San Fran. So what you wanna think about is again, there's how much negative energy you're carrying and then there's how identified you are with it, right? So over time, as you get older, you can release more trauma energy. And so it becomes easier. You're gonna get attacked less, frequent, less frequently and with less severity, but you are gonna have those attacks. And so then what you do in the process of that is you learn the characteristics of that energy 
and then you learn not to identify with it. Then over time, you also learn the, the characteristics of more positive, high vibration energy, and you see where the pockets where that helps the most, results oriented wise, you're gonna get a better inner and outer result, and then you, you can sort of identify with that. That's just sort of like along your journey. And again, the more that you're releasing, the better that you, um, you know, you know, the less that you even have to rely on that. In terms of awareness to when you are triggered, you would want to write that down. As I said, at first you're going to notice after the fact, then you'll start catching it, but you'll still act on it, and only then can you catch it and release it. But for now, it's like write it down. So much of this work, as we did in the first part of this event, is awareness. So every time you're triggered, catch it. If you know also the different ways you tend to try to numb how you feel or escape how you feel, whether it's through you know watching videos online, watching porn, eating, drinking, whatever it is, write those down. Your go-to ways to escape, and that's another perfect opportunity to dive into this and release it. You catch yourself like, wait a minute, what am I doing? That's the question you want to ask yourself. What am I doing? If it's one of those ways of escape, dive into it instead of continuing with the escape. And in terms of results, remember too, it's like until you see things as they are, there's not much you can really do, whether it's the world or even other people. And this is key, that trauma that you're carrying, whatever state is running you, that is coloring your experience of the world. Someone who is run by, say, fear, that's the state that they're in, that colors their experience. Here we're all in the same room, but if you're someone who's run by fear, you're gonna be sitting here like, what are people thinking of me? Am I in danger? What about this? What time is it? Oh my God, this, uh, uh, like nonstop. When you meet someone new, that's where your selective focus is gonna tune in on. Oh, are they dangerous? What about that? And you don't see them as they actually are. Same with someone who's angry. There's so much projection. That drama will be projected out. And if you're not seeing someone as they are, it's very hard to connect with them. It's very hard to even socialize because you don't have the facts. Even your social calibration isn't based on the person, but on what you're projecting onto them. Does this make sense? Okay, so you must release it to then see the world as it actually is. And it's a lot of it's done through self-awareness and now you have the tools to dive in and let go of this. And be very, very aware how important this is. This cannot be underestimated, the importance of this. And I'm gonna say a couple of reasons why, okay? I'm giving you some practical stuff and some abstract stuff. So if you're thinking of, of getting a new partner, for example, business or a um, romantic relationship, what you have is if you ask, say that you ask a guy or girl who you're thinking of getting involved with, what did you think of your day today? What did you think of your month? What did you think of your year? What do you think of your job? What do you think of your exes? Things like that. If they would, if they would kind of rate it at like a four out of 10, five out of 10, six out of 10, you know, whatever it is, that's often a clear indicator of what they're going to think of you. You'll meet somebody and they'll just complain about their ex or their previous job or whatnot, right? Say I'm making a hire and I hear that person complaining about their previous job. Let's say I have a student and they maybe took a, pro a program with another company and they start ripping that company apart. Like, oh, I took, like, because I remember this when I was like 22, I'd have a guy come say, take like an infield training with me and he'd start ripping apart the company of some previous company you work with, right? And I was like, oh man, you got to see our company. It's going to be so much better. Well, and, and I'm like, man, this is going to be great. It's like, you know, this guy, he had a bad experience. Now he's going to get to see the real deal. Well, sure enough, that same guy by the last day would be saying identical things about the experience that that person had had with me, you know, as the, as the previous one, right? People who feel like they're always being screwed over always feel like they're being screwed over. And so conversely, if someone's like, oh, I had a great time with my ex or my last job was awesome. I just, you know, I kind of moved on. We went our own direction. That was really cool. Guess what? That's probably what they're going to be saying about you down the line, okay? Because emotions are addictive. And so just understand that like, you should look at how you describe things. Look, and, and let me be clear here. That doesn't mean that you couldn't have had a crappy ex or a crappy ex job. And, and that's fair. I'm not trying to take away from that. We all have. I 100% have. But like, if you ask me logically, what do you think of like, say, a previous person you're involved with? I can logically tell you like the reality of it and whatnot. But overall, my go-to, like what I'll go to when I'm just kind of just kind of chatting that's gonna be a reflection of my state of consciousness. That's why they say what someone says about you is really what they think about themselves. It's a reflection of their own reality. Again, there's a lot of exceptions to this, guys. It doesn't mean that you can't see the bigger picture. It doesn't mean to be a fake fairy optimist, but it's just related with emotional addiction, okay? Most people can't let a compliment land. Notice even the exercise, staring at each other in the eyes, breaking the tension with laughter, or looking away, just that was hard, letting someone see you. What if someone says, nice shoes? 
Most people would interpret that as sarcastic, like a diss. If a stranger walks up to you like, nice shoes, you're like, fuck that person. <laughs> as you move up, it's like, nice shoes. Oh, these shoes are nothing. You have to deflect it, like the laughter with the eyes, because it's just too much. It's too good for you. And then as you move up, nice shoes, thank you. You let it land. Now that's just a compliment. Think of different opportunities. What are opportunities that are right there in front of you, that people are even pushing on to you, that you're not seen as opportunities? The same as that compliment. Oh, sarcastic diss, when in reality it could have been the best thing ever for you. We do this like crazy. You don't have enough capability with your brain to focus on everything at once. That's why you have an RAS, a selective focus. You will tune out good things. Things that don't enter your reality, things that are not for you, you tune them out. Do you ever see Wayne's World? It's like not worthy, not worthy. That's what we have going on inside and we freak the fuck out. It's easier to stay small. It's, this is like the subtler, worse version of being stuck in your comfort zone because it's not a comfort zone, it's a hell zone. And you can see it in others very easily, but it's harder to see it in yourself. So the million dollar habit is when you see it in others, simply turn that mirror on yourself, go, where's mine? Say, say, where's mine? Where's mine? Right. Launching Transformation Mastery. That was the scariest day ever was launch day. I was like, <gasps> like this moves me in this new reality. And it took a while to get to that point where I could put it out. And then as soon as I put it out, I mean, you see it here, it's like the momentum picked up so fast. Like people just, boom, we're ready. And I was like, whoa, this is growing too fast. And I started freaking the fuck out. I'm like, this is too good for me. It's crazy. Like that's what you'd want. Like your wildest dream, too good for me and you freak out, it's like I'm not ready yet. And this is why you also have to go through, at times, if you don't do this type of work, different references to build up to something. Like I remember when um, I first started helping you out and we'd go speaking, I was like, I wish I could go up in front. If I was in front, I would kill it. And I remember it's like, oh, just go up for 10 minutes. <gasps> and I sucked. And I thought like, if I could just get ahead, but I needed those references to be like, okay, now this is for you. Now, funny enough, if I released a lot of it, I would get the, gone there faster but you can't skip ahead. We all have that ceiling. The same with money. Right now, if you win the lottery, I'd bet my life on it, you'd spend it all. You're like, what, not me, only idiots do the that. Statistics on that are the most revealing thing about this topic. Yeah, if I give you a thousand bucks right now, you're gonna feel that burning a hole in your pocket. You're like, what can I spend it on? It's too good for me. You find a way back. The piece of having savings doesn't resonate with you. You need the chaos of being on the edge. You need the chaos of fighting with your partner. You need the chaos of having problems with the people who you work with, et cetera, et cetera, and, you, and you're addicted. You're in a lower energetic reality. That trauma energy resonates with it. It needs it. It's like if you eat uh, a lot of foods that promote candida, you'll start to, it'll, that, the actual candida in your body parasitically invades your thought process and makes you chase down foods that will get you candida. The major reason why people just love bread. It's actually the candida in their body that says, mm -hmm. That's pretty weird to think about. Well, people don't admit that they love trauma energy, which they actually don't, they kind of hate it, but they're hooked on it and they need to keep replaying it or else the world feels too quiet to them. The more present that you are, the more that you have a palate for subtle peace. Look at that for a moment. The more present to the moment that you are, the more that you can enjoy the flavor of a carrot. But when you're very trapped in your head, you need that like really sugar bomb thing to taste anything. If you're at peace, you can enjoy the subtle peace with your partner. But if you need chaos, you need the drama to feel anything or you feel numb. Yeah. That's a very subtle point there. The more present that you are, the more that you rise up and let go of trauma, the more that you even have a palate to let what is real success land, that you could even feel it as opposed to blocking, as opposed to being in this weird haze and then you need something really intense to break through it to experience emotion. Please consider that one because it's one of the most important ones you'll ever learn. Some Please. other stuff is remind yourself like you will always find a way back. Big question, what do, for some reason, I always find a way back to? This is why you'll see people like they move thinking everything will be different, but for some reason, you find a way back. Create the same circumstances, the same drama, same type of friends, same position, same image, what people think of you. You always find a way back. What do you keep finding a way back to? That's number one. Number two, what's the payoff? What is the unconscious payoff? All the things you hate in your life right now, how do you secretly love those things? What's the payoff? Everything you hate. What do you get out of finding a way back? What do you get out of pushing success away? Why do you secretly love 
pushing success away? Why do you secretly love failing? Why do you secretly love staying stuck at the bottom and playing it small? Because if you're at the bottom and you keep finding a way back to that, you secretly love it. Why? Identify that. What's the payoff? I gave you some examples earlier. If you're carrying a lot of guilt or self-hate, you're not going to let yourself succeed. That's the payoff. You get the you know, justice you deserve. If there's a certain identity that you're attached to, and that identity, like success just doesn't match that identity, you're going to push it away. I pushed it away for years. I'm sure you heard me talk about it. I used to identify as the self-destructive artist. What's the payoff? If I succeed, I'm no longer self-destructive, right? If you identify as, I am this person, I play it small, this is as much success as I'm allowed to have. Anything above that? No, it's not me, because then it challenges my identity. It challenges who I am. The core identity of who you are and every belief that comes from that. So you're going to push that away. You're like, nope, look find at, a way back. Look at the, find a way back. Look at the media and food that gets consumed. It's almost impossible to find healthy food, although it's getting much better. And likewise, look at the most popular shows that are incredibly violent. It's difficult to find any media that you could watch that isn't about conflict, drama, strife, or violence. Have you ever just watched, say, Planet Earth, the series, and just felt so happy and so beautiful and so present? And that's great that you're beginning to resonate with that. But most people, they can't even resonate with that beauty, so they need something more intense. Again, the more that your consciousness is suppressed, you need something very intense or violent or dense in order to even feel. So you need to begin to realize that you have to, you have to cultivate, you have to begin to even resonate with that success and then you start feeding off of it. People who you've seen move really up, they get in the sweet spot where they're just eating healthy food naturally, doing healthy things for themselves naturally, establishing personal boundaries with others naturally, drawing in other like-minded people because you don't attract what you want, you attract what you are. They begin to have a compass for things that are more positive and as the success lands, they don't botch it as easily.